Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this podcast, Critical Design Considerations for PFAS Containment Using Geosynthetics. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, Geofabrics. Geofabrics is Australasia's geosynthesis specialist. They help their clients deliver and maintain infrastructure by minimising risk and increasing value through the innovative use of geosynthetic products. Geofabrics Geo have supported the Australasian infrastructure sector on significant projects from the Victorian level crossing removal to APLNG in Queensland to the Christchurch gondola in New Zealand. On these projects and every project they undertake, Geofabrics have a singular focus to provide smarter infrastructure solutions. I'd now like to welcome our moderator for today, Abel Imaraj. Abel has a deep understanding of the water sector through diverse professional and practical experience with over 30 years in governance, executive, operational and audit roles. Abel is a trusted advisor to national, state and local governments, utilities, corporations, industry bodies and executives in the water sector across Australia. With expertise in co-designing strategy and translating it into implementation to enrich communities and sustain the environment. I now like to introduce Daniel Gibbs. Daniel is the General Manager of Technical Research and Innovation at the Geofabric Centre for Geosynthetic Research, Innovation and Development, GRID. The GRID provides solutions to engineering and environmental challenges through geotechnical review, empirical research and product development. Daniel has over 18 years of quality management, research specification and method development, auditing, innovation and analytical techniques in geosynthetics with a specific focus on bentonite and geosynthetic clay liners. And I'd like to introduce Paul Lightbody. Paul is a consulting engineer with over 30 years experience in environmental engineering. Paul is recognised for his experience in landfill engineering research into recovered products, landfill gas behaviour and sustainable landfill closure. As an advisor to public and private clients, auditors and regulators, Paul is experienced in a diverse range of project requirements, environmental risks, design solutions and stakeholder expectations. Paul formed Mock Inia Consulting in 2015 after leading the Waste and Environment Group of a national consulting practice for 20 years and is currently chair of the WMRR Landfill Division. Thank you very much, Amanda. <clears throat> it's really my pleasure to um, open up with some uh, initial questions to you both, Daniel and Paul. Uh, it was really good to meet and just get a little bit of the background to yourselves. And um, we have a, a range of uh, people listening in from those that are practitioners all the way through to those that are just beginning to explore this idea. So um, some simple ones to start off with. When we talk about these emerging contaminants, uh, what, what exactly do we mean? Thanks. You want to kick that Thanks, off? Um, yes, I, I can do that. Um, it might be interesting to consider how we've looked at emerging contaminants you know, through a historical lens. Um, we can see that some emerging contaminants have appeared at a point in time and tend to emerge like lead, for example, in the, in the 1970s. Um, others through the rise in their use, such as plastics, um, they tend to be classified by type of, of uh, chemical and, and they may be groups, for example, like flame retardants that are used in a lot of products. And they tend to be problematic uh, chemicals which are difficult to manage through uh, lack of understanding or a lack of science or 
the tools to manage them appropriately. There's often no demonstrated link between the exposure and health effects at the time where we become concerned in their, the risks that they pose, um, and that concern may arise from experience with other, other chemicals that are, are similar or have similar characteristics. So instead of clear guidance, they're, they're characterised by uncertainty. Well, the current list mm. is emerging contaminants is a it's a growing list. It you know includes things like pesticides, but also the pharmaceuticals and personal healthcare product um, ingredients. Um, you know, plasticizers, hormones. There's flame retardants, which I've mentioned. You know, nanoparticles, uh, microplastics, and fibres. You know, the perfluoroalkyl compounds. You know, PFAS, persistent organic pollutants, you know, chlorinated paraffins, the, you know, the list goes on and on um, mm. with some of these chemicals. There's there's hundreds of thousands of these of chemicals in, in use. Um, and so there's there's a lot of lot of potential uh, contaminants because you know contamination mm. is is a high concentration in the of a material in the in a sensitive environment. So yeah. They, they may have a lesser consequence in, in service. This is another characteristic I, I perhaps highlight for the purpose of this discussion. Um, their in-service risks when they're, they're brought in as a, as a product um, may be managed and may be low through managing exposure, but over time and at the end of life, they end up in our environment somehow, either in soil or water, but through our waste streams, through the the wastewater system mm. and, and our solid waste streams, and that's where we tend to um, to deal with them in a in a complex mixture, um, and they they become um, materials that uh, are problematic to manage at end of life. Mm. Thanks, Paul. Um, <clears throat> that's a really important point there with the uh, end of life, particularly. Uh, these are all very useful compounds and um, chemicals. But uh, it's when we've uh, got to the end of life, I think, that they start uh, posing a big issue. Is there a thing of uh, peak publishing? When do we actually begin to realise these things are of concern? Or, as I indicated, it's it's you know, it, it is point in time. It's it's as we become aware, um, or there is there is work done, or research done, or um, it. it Maybe through direct experience of exposure of of a of an impact or a consequence mm. of, of these products, um, and that's why I highlighted in the introduction. You know, point in time, we've got examples historically with products like lead and asbestos and and some of the, the pesticides in their early use, which we've we've phased out as we've recognised the the risks um, and assessed them as unacceptable. Mm. Right, and uh, today we're going to be looking in particular at uh, what we're beginning to just loosely call PFAS, or commonly called PFAS. Um, mm -hmm. Could you just explore that a little bit for us and um, explain the composition of these compounds and uh, why this interest, great interest at the moment in this group of contaminants? Oh, it's um, it, it's one that. I think most most of the audience will have will have heard in the in the media and may may well have looked further into, but I'll just give a broad overview, uh, and I'll come back to some of the some of the aspects I think in future questions. Um, PFAS are manufactured chemicals. They're used in products for the for the benefits they bring in properties such as resisting heat, oil, stain, and and water. Um, some examples we we often hear referred to as the the PFOS, PFOA, and um, sometimes PFHXS, um, which belong to the group of chemicals most associated um, for their use in firefighting foams, and that's one of the areas where there's been significant um, issues with contamination around the use of those those products, and so that's where a lot of the the work um, and research has has been directed. Um, PFAS are listed as persistent, or some of these PFAS, the ones I've just mentioned, are 
are listed as persistent organic pollutants or POPs under the Stockholm Convention. Um, but they're only a, a couple of potentially, you know, over 12,000 identified PFAS compounds. So it's a very large group of compounds. Um, they're distinguished by a chain of carbon atoms bonded to, to fluorine atoms. Um, PFAS are used um, in, in many products because of the properties they bring. Um, so they're used in non-stick materials, um, you know, water repellent treatments uh, because of their dispersive properties in firefighting um, foams, uh, weather and stain resistant uh, treatments for products. So they're used in a whole range of consumer products, you know, carpets and other textiles. Um, they are used for those properties also um, within other products such as pesticides, the, the actual formulation of the, the repellents and some industrial processes. Um, these PFAS, the PFOS and PFOA and, and others, they have, tend to have very high solubility um, and the strength of this, this um, carbon-fluorine bond makes them both mobile and persistent in the environment. So it's their persistence and mobility in the environment that gives rise to the concerns around the potential health and ecological risks. They're, they're hard to contain um, and their persistence means they tend to accumulate and they're known to bioaccumulate. And the guidance numbers for um, and criteria currently set some very low concentrations for um, for their um, management or management to very low concentrations. So we we are concerned not just with the the, um, the direct movement of these materials, but we have to be also concerned about their diffusion through barriers um, and the migration through short term handling and management of these materials because they can be washed out through um, just runoff of of rainfall into into stockpiles. Yeah, so it's almost a, the perfect storm, isn't it, with the characteristics of these um, for uh, the natural environment <clears throat> and um, human health hazards. Paul, can you comment on that? Uh, look, I, I'm not a not a health expert, um, and so I won't I won't stray into that. Other than to to say that the, the their persistence and and um, their demonstrated bioaccumulation um, puts them in a class of compounds that we would tep typically be concerned about. Um, and the research is ongoing, but there are indicators of um, you know, risks of health impacts um, and ecological impacts from, um, from their accumulation. Hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, it's beginning to give us a, a, a pretty good, uh, gruesome picture, if you like, of uh, some of the issues. Um, so mm. moving along to what options then do we have to, um, I guess, first of all, quantifying these types of contaminants and um, what sort of approaches have you seen um, in this quantification, these contaminants? Yeah. Look, generally, with emerging contaminants by their nature, um, there, there is often some uncertainty and difficulties in monitoring and managing them due to the lack of science and, and tools um, initially and, and a lagging uh, framework of standards and, and regulation to work within. So that's, that's in, inherent with emerging contaminants. Um, with... PFAS, for, um, in particular, you know, product approvals and standards for, for food packaging tends to focus on on health and managing the direct direct impacts in their in in their service and, and use in products. Um, waste disposal classifications tend to be based on risk and and the end of pipe waste management system that that we that we have means we're dealing with um, unknown compounds and concentrations and mixtures 
um, at, at end of pipe. So this presents just a lot, a lot of challenges around quantifying and putting systems in place to manage these materials, particularly when, for an emerging contaminant. In the case of PFAS, the, the drinking water guidelines are, are very low for, for concentrations of you know, PFOS, for example, it's 0 0.07 micrograms per litre. Um, and some PFAS can be quantified to very low concentrations in, in water, um, but it's not as easily detected at these levels in, in products or in, in heavily contaminated mixtures found in, in waste. Um, and the commercially available techniques um, laboratories offer, you know, typically identify and measure up to 33, you know, compounds, including those three PFAS I've mentioned that are of the highest concern, the PFOS, PFOA and PFHXS. But other compounds, and there's fluorotelomers and fluoropolymers that can also be present. Um, there's intermediate transformation products and precursors, uh, the long chain PFAS can, can um, decompose and transform into um, the shorter, shorter chain and more mobile PFAS compounds of concern. Um, they're not typically within the analyte suites that are, that are available commercially. Um, and so we need tools such as broad screening um, analysis um, you know, instead of and non-selective analytical techniques such as you know, the TOPA test or a total oxidizable precursor assay, um, which looks at the total potential for, for PFAS um, compounds in a in a material. So, um, and for those um, for those results, we we don't necessarily have criteria to work to in the guidance, but we have methods to start assessing and quantifying the the amount of PFAS that may be present in a, in a material or in a waste. Yeah, thanks for that, Paul. Who in Australia would be the regulatory authority for uh, quantification and regulation of these contaminants? There is a, a um, there are some systems in place for just regulating the use of chemicals um, in products and bringing you know products to market, um, which I I can't give um, give too much information about, but the regulation of the um, of the the disposal and remediation of the environmental and um, health um, effects of PFAS sit with the health authorities in each state and the. EPAs in each state. Um, the national government um, agencies are responsible for the um, compliance or conformance to the treaty obligations, such as the Stockholm Convention, Basel Convention, and the cross-border movements of of these materials. But for for most people, they're, they're uh, who are involved in managing PFAS in a in a containment or a remediation. Uh, setting uh, dealing with a with an environmental regulator, the, the local EPA. Okay, uh, just interested in exploring what are these key aspects of um, managing this um, or containing these contaminants. So, looking at the site and also um, the type of contaminant itself. Yeah. Well, for for new facilities um, for containment, the siting and design. Are the primary controls to minimise risk to the environment and human health um, for landfill siting and design? Um, it must have regard to the you know the topography, the geology, the hydrogeology, proximity to ground and surface water, um, given the the mobility of, of these compounds, um, and the proximity to sensitive ecological or human receptors you know, to sensitive um, receiving water system or a drinking water supply. Um, now the key factors in performance are likely to, to revolve around the, the climate, the geology and the hydrogeology um, and the buffer dis or distance to, to these sensitive um, receptors. Um, I'd also highlight 
the management of the leachate that is going to be generated in the handling of these materials or uh, in, a, in, a, in a stockpile or in a, in a landfill, the leachate disposal pathway, which is going to tend to contain the PFAS, which are mobile and, and will be leached out and report to the leachate, um, the pathway and the treatment that may be necessary with that leachate um, are a key, a key aspect that may influence siting because appropriate, an appropriate disposal pathway is needed. From a, a tri more triple bottom line perspective, it's also important that the containment location is, you know, an appropriate uh, proximity to the source, so that the, the management of the materials is actually practical. Um, you know, there's questions like, should we have uh, lots of small containment facilities around around our communities, or is it better to have fewer larger sites, um, which are uh, appropriately engineered and managed and, and monitored for the for the containment of these materials? Uh, you know, another good question is whether they're better off in an impacted environment, you know, near an urban area or a peri-urban area versus a remote. An impacted area, you know, an outback location may may be a wilderness um, and a and a quite a, a, an unimpacted environment, you know, which is actually more appropriate. And stakeholder stakeholder um, concerns need to be addressed. Um, you know, concept of social license and you know, the challenges of um, you know the, the NIMBY um, view that will often be taken if if we highlight. One of these facilities, or single it out for for attention, where it is actually part of a system um, that we rely on for the management of waste and materials within within our society and within our urban urban setting. Mm. Lots lots of factors to take into account during the design. Um, can you just run us through maybe some of those design objectives and uh, how that might influence the design? In the early yeah. early parts of uh, the design phase here. Yeah, sure. Um, firstly, it's it's important and necessary to establish clearly some objectives for the design. Um, is it a temporary or is it a, a final containment? Um, and who holds the the operational responsibility and and who's managing the the longer term risks for for monitoring and managing the, the containment system. The National Environment Management Plan, or NEMP, um, in, a, in Australia treats on-site storage, stockpiling and containment quite separately from disposal, end-of-life disposal to, to landfill. For on-site storage, stockpiling or containment, it provides a risk-based set of measures and infrastructure, which are scaled according to time frame. You know, the longer the the time frame, the more significant the engineering controls become. And it considers short term and transient time frames, um, less than five years, and considers longer term um, to be greater than five years. It includes things like covered and bundled stockpiles on an in, impermeable base. Um, and goes through to double packaging or double line systems or double bunding and containment for, for the longer term, so more highly engineered systems. Um, and it emphasises the management, again, of leachate and water runoff from, from those sites. For final disposal, um, the NEMP sets out acceptance criteria for different levels of landfill design from you know, old landfills or unlined or clay-lined cells, there's quite low concentrations um, which are permitted for those designs and the guidance, um, again, scales up to composite-lined and double composite-lined landfills where duplicate um, composite lining systems with a leak detection and relief system are provided the lower primary liner, and again, um, the management of the leachate is is a focus. The criteria, though, are 
only for the PFOS, PFHXS and PFOA compounds in the current guidance. And it is highlighted that further quantification of the potential um, PFAS that might be present um, in the leachate and in the waste be undertaken and, and those risks are further studied. Um, mm -hmm. Because the precursor compounds that I mentioned earlier are, are present and particularly in, in the waste streams, whereas in the on-site storage and stockpiling, quite often we're dealing with the, the more known PFOS and PFOA compounds that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. well, how old are some of the oldest containment sites in Australia, or globally for that matter? Certainly from the 1970s, um, containment um, and long-term containment systems have been engineered and developed around the world. Um, there's been development in EPA regulation around containment systems, particularly in the US, but also in parts of Europe from the late 70s um, and, and through the 80s and contain, uh, containment systems in waste disposal sites in, a, in Australia, for example, have, have been around since at least the, the 19, mid 1980s, um, but are ubiquitous now in, in all facilities and uh, composite mining mm -hmm. is now common in major landfills and double composite mine facilities are available in most states um, now to handle the more problematic waste streams requiring final disposal. Um, there are also a class of disposal sites for the, the hazardous waste, which I'm, I, I don't include in that category, I'm not talking about disposal of radioactive wastes or, or high level hazardous wastes. Um, they tend to be stored and, and treated, not, not disposed of in the untreated state. <clears throat> well, just expanding a little bit further on that, um, can you take us through some of the national regulatory guidance material, uh, what, what's available and um, uh, what, what are the differences in ap applying those amongst the states? Yeah, well, look, since 2018, there's been an Australian National Environment Management Plan um, developed and agreed um, by the heads of e the EPAs. Uh, we're currently we have revision three of that that guidance um, out for consultation. So, um, in a relatively short period of time, there's been quite active revision and planned future revision of this guidance, um, uh, consistent with this being an emerging contaminant and a, and a and a developing area. That document is the, the primary guidance in Australia for the EPAs. It sets out um, current understanding, current approaches, um, and current uh, guidance criteria uh, for the PFAS compounds of concern. It also offers some, some guidance around how to approach the, the other um, precursor compounds and, and PFAS substances that are that are present and uh, and the need to consider those. Each state, though, through its own EPA, has its own regulations, and they implement um, regulation and apply the the guidance in the NEMP through their own regulation. And, and there are differences from state to state, just timing differences and, and regulatory differences from the, that stem from the underlying legislation and regulations. So it's always important to approach the local regulator, um, consider their, their current guidance, but also ask about future or upcoming guidance, um, given that this is an emerging uh, and a reasonably rapidly changing space in terms of guidance. Is there much interstate movement of uh, contaminants? Um, there is, and those differences between the states have created a potential for 
commercial and practical reasons to, to move materials across state boundaries. Um, the EPAs, though, do have some protocols in place and do communicate um, around the movement of materials across state state boundaries for for uh, waste of concern, particularly. So um, the the guidance is the same, but practically there, there can be some differences that drive drive movement of materials, but it's, um, it is usually done with some regulatory oversight. Thanks, Paul. Daniel, um, I'd love to have uh, some of your insights on containment and in particular, looking at geosynthetics. Um, thank you for sharing um, your insights on, you know, outside of mechanical performance of uh, geosynthetics. Um, what else is important in uh, in design? Yeah, so <clears throat> we really need to look a bit deeper than uh, than standardised index tests. As much as they are important, mechanicals and physical properties of geosynthetics very important, but they really only give us a single snapshot of the material properties under very specific and very controlled conditions. Um, so. We really have to move into, um, in a lot of cases, performance-based assessments. And these are really extremely valuable uh, during the design phase, particularly, as they often take the proposed design variables and the site's geotechnical and uh, hydrological and environmental data and use these specific inputs to test and produce results that can more closely represent actual field performance of the geosynthetics um, either individually or within a system. And these types of tests, the performance tests, uh, are generally run over a longer period of time. And they can be physical, mechanical, um, hydraulic, chemical, uh, durability assessments come into it. Um, and we do this to get a better estimate as to how long they're going to function as per the design and the application requirements. Now, we can analyze these in real time, and we certainly do this with a range of our manufactured products in our laboratories. Uh, in fact, some tests we've had going uh, for eight years here in our research laboratory. Um, and of course, the higher the performance of the product, the longer it takes to degrade uh, in these tests and in the environment. Uh, but since most construction projects are often constrained by time, we also look at using somewhat standardized accelerated analysis. And one way we can do this is by increasing the temperature of the test, uh, either in immersion tests or oven aging tests, and uh, sometimes a combination of both of those. And what that does is it allows us to calculate the expected design lives based on the half-life of the material using Arrhenius modeling. The half-life being the point at which the material has lost 50% of a key material property uh, and for geosynthetic materials, we typically use tensile strength as the indicator. Polymeric materials are not always going to last hundreds of years. Uh, it really depends on the, the application, the quality of the installation, the stabilization package uh, used in the polymer, the type of polymer, the geotechnical and environmental aspects of the site, uh, the expected loads on the materials, the chemistries on site, and, and so forth. It, it's actually quite a long list of variables. Um, I've seen physical changes in exposed geotextiles, for example, literally within 24 hours on site. Uh, and I've also seen other geotextiles last over 20 years in exposed environments, while still retaining greater than that 50% uh, initial tensile strength. So all of these factors need to be considered when modeling performance. And that's really important uh, when trying to understand and quantify the impact of PFAS, particularly on geosynthetic lining materials, which to be honest, we've really only scratched the surface on. Because while certain PFAS in relatively low concentrations, and particularly the long chain variants, which are less mobile than the shorter chains, while they may not diffuse uh, terribly quickly through HDP geomembranes, uh, which are stabilized appropriately, and, uh, and particularly have high stress crack resistance. The questions which we don't really have answers for are how do the many different types of PFAS, and as Paul said, there's now uh, over around 12,000 of these, um, how, how do they actually move through liners, including the ultra short chains, 
which are far more mobile, volatiles, the precursor PFAS, um, and then also what negative impacts are they having on the polymeric structure as they either sit on them or diffuse through them, through the uh, amorphous regions. We know that surfactants, um, we know they're surfactants. So, so things like stress crack resistance for tumor membranes becomes a very important criterion. And equally important when we're talking about GCLs is the advective flow of these contaminants through um, the system. And we know that bentonite doesn't stop PFAS. Um, it moves quite readily through it, in, in fact. Um, but activated carbon does a great job for the attenuation uh, of PFAS, a wide range of PFAS. Um, and a wide range of other organic contaminants for that matter uh, as well. So, so modeling diffusion and adsorption within the different components of the GCL is important. Uh, we know that polypropylene, for example, is quite porous compared to polyester and uh, is more likely to sorb more PFAS. Uh, and we're actually part of a cooperative research study at the moment with uh, Monash University in Victoria, which we started a few years ago. And, uh, and this is focused uh, specifically on both quantifying the amount of PFAS migrating through composite lining systems uh, in basal liners and caps. And it includes individual assessments of each of the components, which for a base liner in a landfill, for example, begins with the separation geotextile, which sits above the drainage aggregate layer, uh, as well as the protection geotextile, the geomembrane, the GCL, including the various synthetic components, uh, as well as the bentonite and activated carbon um, in the case of a hybrid GCL. Um, and then also the subgrade, of course. Um, so making the research really the first of its kind in the world to look at that entire lining system and how these, these chemistries move through. Thanks, Daniel. Also interested in exploring, <clears throat> so now we're looking at the applicability of, uh, say, a particular geosynthetic material and a particular contaminant, and we're looking at uh, application at a particular site, say, a specific design for that site. So can you take us through the levels of assessment in, um, in this design process? Right. Well, I think the very first thing you need to understand and, and quantify is the type of contaminant uh, or contaminants, because there can be some synergistic effects. Um, the expected concentrations of each of those is really important. Um, and the expected level of exposure to the geosynthetics. Um, and, and we do that generally to start with uh, using some form of desktop assessment. And this can often include a literature review, um, things like looking at product data sheets for geosynthetics, peer reviewed papers, you know, where has it been done before uh, and so forth. Um, there's various desktop calcs which exist for things like maximum strains and loads, uh, flow rates, lifetime estimates based on generalized polymer polymer chemical compatibility. Um, we know a bit more about outdoor UV performance on each polymer type um, and so forth. If, if it's a barrier like a geomembrane or a GCL, uh, advection and diffusion rates come into play. Um, so they're quite, quite standardized if you're looking at certain um, defects or, or you know, issues um, with those materials uh, during installation. Uh, if it's a geotextile, of course, pH may play a role uh, and so forth. So that desktop assessment really is the first step. It's a reasonably quick step that you can take, um, but, but that needs to pass that first stage. And if those results look generally okay, uh, then depending on the risk profile of the application and the desired design life of the project, the designer might then choose to undertake some short-term physical analyses using their proposed design inputs uh, in combination with either the specific geosynthetics by themselves individually, or in a lot of cases, setting up that analysis uh, using the system as a whole. And this often includes the use of site-specific materials as well, such as uh, the liquids and the soils, and the geotechnical materials on site. Uh, and the outcomes here at this stage can be varied depending on the specific interaction of the different materials under the expected conditions on site. Um, Short-term tests can often give the designer more precise numbers, which can then be used directly in the design, but ultimately it's still short-term and there are generally still some extrapolations that are required through that process. Um, 
But if the geosynthetic material has been specifically designed for a uh, very high performance, and we've got uh, you know good examples of that these days, um, then you know we may need to do this for a longer term, and those interaction assessments may be longer um, because that performance is so much higher. So, for example, a geomembrane with a very high stress crack resistance, uh, or a GCL that's uh, in, uh, with modified bentonite which is a very high tolerance to hyperalkaline environments, for instance, you would need to run those tests um, through to that half-life. And, uh, and so that can take quite a bit of time. Mm. And, you know, as I mentioned, we can use temperature to accelerate the degradation of these polymers, um, but it's not always possible. Uh, so I suppose while the lit literature review is a very good first run on the due diligence ladder, it can never really give you a precise set of values for the project. So I guess, to put it simply, to lower the risk of failure, nothing really compares to actual testing uh, on the proposed product uh, using site-specific materials and project-specific design inputs. And are there any models that can assist you in this analysis, uh, Daniel? Yep, there are. Um, there's some standardised models that can be used, um, some standardised software that can be used. Um, the challenge with PFAS is that we really we really don't have enough information. Um, so you can do some modelling, uh, but then as as we learn more, those models will get a bit more precise in terms of um, the outcomes. Mm -hmm. And is there a, a body of knowledge being compiled with this in mind to help with the future design work? Um, there is, and, and it's, there's a couple of, um, at university levels, as I mentioned, we've got this program with Monash and the, the key, the core, um, uh, output for that is really to model that, um, movement of, of a number of different PFAS through the entire system so that we can understand, um, you know, what's coming out the other end and what's coming out underneath. So the idea is to, um, really map that out. And that works well with product development as well. So, you know, you can use that information in unison with, with uh, product development um, to understand how to create better geosynthetic products that do a better job, um, for example, um, as barriers. Yeah, it's a lovely combination of both um, design work and product development and research. Yeah. Um, just coming to, <clears throat> so we, we're getting the message that really, um, you know, an important part of this is um, testing on the proposed products at site and, um, you know, specific to the application. Uh, when should these assessments be carried out and how would that sort of be stepped through? Yeah, so really early involvement in the design phase is absolutely critical. Yeah, because there's, because there are several steps in that assessment process, uh, as early as physically possible, to be truthful. Um, some of these tests can take months uh, to potentially years to really quantify the, that degradation process and true longer term performance. You know, the longer you run these tests, the less extrapolation you'll need uh, to do and the more precise the outcome will be. So the idea is to gather as much information as possible because the more information you have, the higher the chances are that the product will perform at least up to that required design life and, and ideally in a lot of cases well beyond that. Uh, and if we think that uh, really about landfill and put, put through the lens of landfill, for example, those geosynthetic components need to last. They need to continue performing their barrier function uh, well beyond the 30 years of post-closure care that's required. They ideally have to last hundreds and hundreds of years to ensure we're really satisfying our environmental um, intergenerational equity obligations, which effectively means meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Hmm. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, so there's, um, over, the, over the life of that material, we're expecting to see significant changes in its, um, in its material properties and so on. Um, can you sort of outline how that performance of the material changes over time, in particular when it's in contact with the uh, contaminated materials? Sure. Um, well, all polymers degrade. 
It's just a question of how and when. Now, we know a great deal more these days about the mechanisms involved in polymer degradation, um, like biological, chemical, oxidative, hydrolytic, uh, stress and UV, uh, and the effects uh, of these materials that exposure can do, like um, reducing the molecular weight, severing time molecules, which bridge that amorphous zone of semi-crystalline materials, um, reduction of free radicals, and by extension, these effects reduce the mechanical properties and therefore the time to failure. But when it comes to PFAS, as I mentioned, all we really know is that due to the structure of PFAS, they're classified as surfactants, which means they're amphiphilic and so largely irrespective of whether the liquid they're in is water or oil-based, they have a strong association with the liquid. And this can be within the liquid itself um, or at the air-liquid interface. And because of these reasons, it makes them extremely mobile, able to travel wherever the liquid travels. So that's the first point. Second point is that we now have a fairly deep understanding of how surfactants cause stress cracking in HDPE due membranes at certain concentrations when they're under mechanical stress and in contact with these chemicals. Uh, and there's a fairly strong correlation between increasing surfactant concentration with decreasing time to failure in HDPE geomembranes. membranes. Um, and there have been examples of HDPE geomembranes membranes used in the storage of PFAS laden liquids, uh, which have failed within months. So we know it's a risk. Um, it's just about management of that risk and choosing the, the right uh, set of design inputs to ensure that we've, uh, we've covered that. Are there any options in uh, reducing the moisture content and reducing that uh, effect of the surfactant to dry, that, dry out some of these um, contaminants? Um, there are, and you know, you, you demobilize the contaminants if you take the liquid out. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that may not be um, possible in, in every scenario, but it's a, it's a good thought um, because you, you can stabilize them. And, and certainly in soils, uh, you know, they are reasonably stable. They are fixed depending on what the, the, um, the specifics of the soil uh, are. Uh, we know that they can affix to organic carbon and, and the like. So, um, yeah, demobilizing is a great, uh, a great thought where you can uh, make that happen, I suppose. Mm. Okay. Coming to <coughs> design life, uh, Daniel. Uh, these these type of changes to the material, um, how how does that play out in the expected design life of of these uh, geomembranes? Yeah, so design lives are all about uh, a system performing a certain function or set of functions for a designated time period. Uh, the moment that system or the elements of that system stop performing their function as intended or as designed then in most cases, that's the end of the design life. Uh, I say most cases because if, for example, a geomembrane develops a small hole during installation, technically in that specific zone, it's actually no longer performing its function as a barrier. But we don't go and tear up the lining system to replace it. We simply repair it if we can, or hopefully um, we have a secondary containment layer, such as a GCL underneath to slow the flow of liquid into the subgrade, which then ultimately upholds the barrier function of the system as a whole. So there's some practicalities around design as well um, when you're looking at this, and, and certainly from a design perspective, um, you know, when you're designing a single composite lined system, those factors should be considered that, you know, ultimately all, all of these types of barriers uh, will, will leak, and whether that's inherent in the material as it comes off the production line, uh, or if it's uh, you know during that installation phase, they can be damaged. So we need to account for that. Um, but when it comes to PFAS and, and liquids containing PFAS, uh, again, depending on the concentration, we know that there's a risk that at least some of that PFAS is likely to pass through the geomembrane, both uh, advectively through holes, as I mentioned, or and also via diffusion. Uh, which again could potentially be doing an unknown level of damage during its transmission through the liner. Um, and we know that PFAS travels readily through the bentonite in the GCL, uh, 
um, then if you look at that, really that system may not be performing its intended barrier function for very long at all. Um, and, and some of those variables associated with how long this is will really depend on the composition and concentration of the liquid, uh, the confining loads on the system, the hydraulic head pressure, exposure to UV and, and so forth. So again, assessments to understand the half-lives of each component of a lining system, for example, using site-specific chemistries under the maximum expected loads, uh, temperatures and hydraulic conditions are absolutely critical. And, and you know, when it comes to PFAS, it is really important to, to um, uh, understand the initial properties of those materials first and then sort of weave in what we understand about PFAS and how that travels as well. So Daniel, as a system begins to reach its um, design end of life, uh, what recourse do we have? Does that mean we need to reinstate the barriers and therefore it's a complete new investment again in, in the system? Uh, it can be. I mean, landfill is incredibly difficult, uh, as you appreciate, mm. to, to replace um, basal liners. Um, practically impossible, actually. So there are other mechanisms, there are other things you can do, cut off walls and the like, um, if we get to a point where we need to re-engineer that landfill, for example. Um, but in some cases, yeah, that, that is certainly appropriate. And, um, you know, for certain products in certain applications, you can access those and replace them. And that's part of that maintenance um, process. But Ideally, and, and, and that can change as well, depending on changing regulation. So, um, you know, if all of a sudden our regulation drops and those already very small values for PFAS are reduced even further, then all of a sudden we need to have a look at what we've got, um, you know, currently out there and redesign new landfills and, and new areas, um, but also have a look at what we've got um, historically sitting there that we need to uh, address. So yeah, in some cases where it's possible to to look at replacement, that's that's great, um, but that may not always be possible. Hmm. Thanks, Daniel. Um, just thinking about then uh, the future, and um, we mentioned uh, some product development that needs to be associated with it, and there's almost like a a research and innovation element to the design. So can you just take us through why you believe that this is um, the R&D and innovation is so critical to this particular area? Yeah, so geosynthetic uh, product R&D will always be important um, for many years to come. Because even if we continue to use the exact same products that we have today, uh, the applications can change. The environments we put these products into can change. The regulation can change. Uh, there's differences in, in you know, on-site chemistries, changes in the environment surrounding each site, uh, new understanding of the human and ecological impact of the emerging contaminants such as PFAS. So, so I guess that, that's one reason, even if we were to keep with our current product range. But generally, it's not in human nature to continue on the same path. Uh, we, we, as a race, love to innovate. Uh, and in a lot of ways, research is critical um, as a direct result of innovation. As we continuously improve our current geosynthetic products uh, in terms of their performance and durability, um, but also when we create brand new products, we need to understand their performance characteristics in both standard and channel challenging environments to really quantify their capabilities, but perhaps more importantly, quantify their limitations. So research really is a never ending cycle um, Right now, emerging contaminants, um, sustainability, climate change, these are all a big focus. Uh, and so as an industry, we're focused on developing products to meet these challenges, um, some of which have been specifically designed to address these particular global issues. Um, and we do that through things like hybrid GCLs containing activated carbon, um, geotextiles made using recycled and, and natural raw materials, raw materials that are produced using sustainable feedstocks, alongside materials which have been engineered to break down into harmless byproducts. And while innovation and product development is typically driven uh, by the desire to solve a problem, it can only really be successful if the end goals are precisely defined. And these goals usually include 
measuring the performance outputs against a particular specification, which itself is often driven by some level of codified guidance or, or regulation, as Paul indicated. So, yes, research and innovation are, are absolutely critical and will continue uh, if we want to continue to solve complex environmental problems such as PFAS. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Paul, did you have any closing thoughts or comments? Oh, look, I would go back to some of Daniel's comments on on design life, um, and and just reiterate the distinction that, that the the NEMP makes between storage of PFAS and end uh, what's an acceptable concentration for disposal and final disposal to landfill. It sets some very low concentrations for acceptance into landfill. So primarily the, the risk around a failure or a, a design life um, that was in a, inadequate in a landfill is by setting very low concentrations that are actually factored from drinking water criteria for the, for the landfill. Um, and that in a final containment setting, there are other factors such as the, um, the depleting source of PFAS within the waste that's actually partitioned and removed through the leachate collection system. So the PFAS is one of those compounds which will, will tend to flush out and, and report to the leachate and be removed from the system over time. So depleting that longer term potential risk if there is a, a, a breach or a a failure of the, the liner down the track. Um, mm -hmm. And as, Dan, as Daniel indicated, the, the failures in the materials are often um, assessed in terms of a nominal failure of a, of a parameter, such as tensile strength, whereas the actual failure to contain um, may take a considerably longer period of time to reach. So. For, for the challenge, I think, with emerging contaminants in particular, is to understand the the leaching and removal from the and and stabilisation processes that also occur within containment systems to to ensure that that is understood to set an appropriate design life or design goal for for a containment system. And again, you'll recall I'm, I said, I highlighted the NEMPS uh, looked at time. Of, of storage, particularly if the on-site containment and, and the, the, a risk-based approach is taken there. Um, and so they've extended that through to final final disposal in, in landfill by setting some very low numbers. Well, thank you very much, um, Paul Lightbody, who's the Principal at Environment and Waste Management, Mock and Consulting, and uh, Daniel Gibbs, the General Manager of Technical Research and Innovation at Geofabrics Australia. Thank you so much for your time and for your generosity in sharing your insights.